Good morning, dear BCM Siege family. So we are we have gathered here for this week's uh, quest, and uh, we'll start the day with prayer. May I invite um, Dr. Ajit Koshi to lead us in prayer? Uh, 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and praise Thee for this wonderful morning Thou hast given us. Lord, thank You for helping us to see the dawn of yet another day. Lord, we seek Your blessings upon everything we do today, especially we come at this gathering into Your hands, Lord. Lord, please be with the speaker and bless him as he explains the latest developments in the area of medicine, Lord. Let, let's imbibe them and let us use it for the benefit of our patients. Lord, bless us with your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have an erudite faculty from our biochemistry conference for today's quest. I welcome Dr. George Andisar to introduce the speaker to us. Good morning, everyone. In the year 2002, I had uh, finished most of my clinical work and uh, started as director of CMC. That was the year in the same building where I was working. A young man came whom all the girls are telling me he looks like Lionel Messi, so we want to come and see him. <coughs> so you'll probably have to darken pa parts of the beard, I think. <laughs> Dr. Balamurugan Ramadas, he's professor and heading the laboratory at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhubaneswar. He did his undergraduate and postgraduate training in Jipma Pondicherry, and then joined us in CMC Valore. Worked for a couple of years on some very interesting areas which he's going to tell us about, and then went on to do his PhD what he did at that time was uh, train with one of my colleagues by name Professor B.S. Ramakrishna. And that was a time many years ago when we were into tropical sprue in a big way. All the conversations would be about what's happening inside the gut, which most people didn't understand. Then suddenly, because tropical sprue disappeared, we also stopped talking about it. So when... <coughs> Bala joined us. He was given several fancy options, but he chose the most difficult and the most unrecognized option of looking at the bacterial flora within the gut. And today, all the world over, this is the buzzword. Reno, you'll agree with me? The buzzword is about the microbiome, the gut microbiome what is happening within the gut and what is the relevance it has to humankind. So his PhD was on molecular studies of the commensal fecal anaerobic flora in health and diarrheal disease. He had his postdoc work in some of the leading centers abroad, including Stanford, Tufts, and uh, University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. He won't tell you all this, so I'll just mention the Indo-French Sandwich Scholarship in Paris, Indo-French Postdoc Fellowship. And he tells me that the original idea came from the French, and as usual, the Americans gobbled it, and they're trying to pretend that it is their idea. Lots of projects, lots of students and trainees, lots of publications, and he also has a tie-up with IIT Bhubaneswar. In fact, I think you went to Bhubaneswar as uh, uh, in order to help them come up with newer ideas. But we have in our midst somebody who is uh, exceptional, somebody who is brilliant, somebody who is doing a lot of translational work. Um, so after he finishes, you must ask questions because he is in the village, Saritha. He, his people are in the village trying to identify, and ma'am, Girija ma'am, about how rice water can be the answer uh, and for that, to show how fermented rice water benefits our people. So shall we put our hands together and welcome the one and only <laughs> Professor Bala Murugis Ramdas. Lionel Messi for the girls. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, Chi. Chi. Thank you, sir. Um, I've seen you from the very first day, and uh, and I see you develop this place. It looks great, and I'm sure you are motivating, uh, like how I got motivated from you from the day one. I'm sure you're motivating the younger generation here. Thank you again for having me here. Um, and uh, as always, uh, um, it's a pleasure to be where wherever you call me. Yes, sir. Thank you again. <clears throat> So all of us walk around uh, with an aura. And this aura is the aura of bacteria, OK? If you minus yourself, this is how we look like, OK? We are all carrying a lot of microbes within and on us. And uh, if looks like it doesn't work. So if you were to imagine um, uh, two terms I'll introduce. If you were to imagine the number of microbial cells uh, in our body, it would, in your body, it would look like more microbes than less of a human cell. The pointer works. So, so this is how uh, it looks like. If, if you were to uh, count the number of uh, microbial cells versus your, your cells in your body, your cells in your body would be uh, this uh, smaller a proportion. When compared to the number of genes, uh, this is how the human genes would look like if you compare the microbial genes that are in your body. So there are two terms here. One is the microbiota, which is the sum total of all the microbes that reside within you and within you. And uh, the term microbiome includes all the genetic material plus the microbes that are residing in you. Okay? So these are just the two terms that, that I will uh, interchangeably use, where microbiota is the live organism, while microbiome is the sum total of the genomic material plus the microbe itself. So uh, I, I'll pitch in uh, as gut dysbiosis, uh, the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle or solving the jigsaw puzzle. <clears throat> uh, microbiome and he human health have been uh, you know, there for many, many uh, years, many, many centuries. 1900, 1900s when L. Mechnikov talked about uh, uh, consuming fermented food uh, uh, helps, um, you know, living longer in a population in the European population. And from there, what we have is an increased correlative studies in terms of, uh, in terms of metabolic disorders to depression to NAPL to, uh, you know, as simple as restless leg syndrome. Microbiome is implicated in everything that, that, is, uh, that is, you can think about. So in the last decade, the, the question was whether this is a cause or effect. And then there are plenty of data that is accumulating in terms of the cause and effect of change uh, in microbiome. So, uh, so what and why are we studying this? Because uh, the Human Microbiome Project, like the Human Genome Project, is an in thing now. And uh, this is. It is only possible because the microbiome is rich in diversity and uh, the membership varies from person to person and across age and so on. And then if it is changing across age, uh, then is there a point studying it? Yes, because they are resilient for, uh, 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 to any insult, basically. They're resilient to any insult, so which means they form a succession pattern across age. They form a succession pattern, which means a baby might, might be born with very less microbe uh, or depending on the mode of delivery, 
and an elderly person might have uh, uh, microbes that are uh, that are shrinking in diversity. So, so both ends of life have less diverse microbe, while the the middle age has a, a peak in the microbial diversity. When I say microbial diversity, it is the number of microbe microbial types that increase. It's not the count that matters. It is the number of types of microbes. So I'm pitching it uh, in a basic level so that we all interact at the end of the session. So I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, yeah. So the microbiome is resis uh, resilient to changes. So which means uh, when we have patterns studied across age and across conditions, then it means that all of us will be carrying a microbiome ID card when we are in healthy mode. So why care about common cells? Because they have plenty to offer. <clears throat> For instance, the first reason could be that they're protective in function. They form barrier. Wherever they are present, they're present on the skin, they're present in any, any parts of your body you can now imagine. Microbes are in brains and in fetus, so there is no, no place in our body that doesn't have microbes. So, so they can first offer protection by forming uh, uh, what is called resistance to colonization or barrier function. Second is they can, they can, keep, uh, they can keep all the pathogens away. Okay? They can keep pathogens away by multiple factor, like they compete for nutrient, they compete or they produce all kinds of antimicrobial uh, uh, peptides or factors like acid and so on. So, uh, these determine how they can they can form uh, their their niche in the body. Also, uh, in the, in their absence, there are there are other microbes that might have a blooming effect. Second, uh, they actually help in developing your immune system. So the way you respond to certain stimuli alters depending on the kind of microbe you harbor. Lastly, or most essentially, they actually take part in your metabolic function. So this, I would like to call it as the nutrient microbiome access. So which means they are going to produce a lot of beneficial vitamins to, they produce what is called the, the short chain fatty acid. The, the, I, I call it the God molecule. The short chain fatty acids are produced by these microbes as their end products and the short chain fatty acids can be easily absorbed in our body. And they also produce uh, vitamins like vitamin K, B1, B12 that essentially we consume in minor quantity in our, particularly in the Asian uh, population. Yeah. And we also require more B1 but we, uh, we since we are the rice eating population but these are, there are microbes that help us produce these vitamins. So now you know any alteration to these microbes might be a problem. So this used to be a major, major challenge those days when we started, why care about common cells? These are common cells, these are normally residing, why do you care? So now we understand any alteration may be causing the disease. So a quick attention to the slide, this is a 20 years old uh, uh, publication. Uh, if you look at this graphs here, there are two graphs, one on the right side, which talks about a reducing trend in infectious disease. On the right, if you see all the infectious diseases are reducing from 90, 1950 to 2000, while on the left, if you see, there are certain conditions with, which is on the race. Okay? Here, we have one organism causing the disease and it, those are the infectious causes. While here, we have diseases that are multifactorial and are not curable diseases. And what I call the disorder of the civilized, civilized. Because the lifestyles have significantly changed in the last century, and then there, are, there is this increase in all this non-communicable diseases. So, what could be the reason? So that's where we started. And uh, uh, we think that there are two possibilities that happen. One is there are a group of protective or the good bugs in our gut. And then the second is the bad bugs or the aggressive bugs. 
So in all of us, all of us here, we keep them in balance. We keep this in balance, and this is the homeostasis. And the health that we define, it depends on the balance between these protective microbes and the aggressive microbes. So what happens if this increases, or the option is that the protective bugs can decrease. So in isolation, whatever, whichever happens, then that's the term called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is very simple. It is the loss of the diversity. It's the loss of that microbial diversity in your gut. It's the loss of microbial diversity in your gut. So it could be increased aggressive microbe as well as decrease in the beneficial microbes in the gut. So essentially, we think that dysbiosis could be the heart of the race in non-communicable diseases. Um, of course, uh, now there are multiple microbiome axes is defined, uh, of which the gut-brain axis is being, all of this are well studied. The gut-brain axis, uh, the gut-lung axis, gut-lung axis came to existence or uh, limelight because of this COVID. Uh, and then there is this gut liver axis and all, almost all the gut axis are, have been, are, are being studied in the world, uh, in the world now. <clears throat> so one of the axis that I, in my lab personally we study is the, is the gut immune axis and the gut nutrient axis. And particularly my interest is uh, understanding undernutrition biology. Uh, and how to intervene under nutrition biology by, uh, by, by using microbiome. So that's my research interest. And, uh, uh, but we also host what is called the Center for Clinical Microbiome Research at Ames Bhubaneswar. So my responsibility is to act as the spoke and the hub model where I, uh, I encourage all the clinicians to collaborate with me. So I kind of act as a centerpiece and then try and interact with all the clinicians in the, in the institute. So, so I kind of, you know, I'm everywhere, but I, I actually work as the hub model where, you know, I provide the facility to perform the microbiome research. So what do we do? We actually do two things. One is to predict and second is to intervene. So what do we predict? We predict the patterns of microbes, look at what has changed, and then we try and reset microbiome for health. These, we just do just two things, prediction, and then intervene to, for health. <clears throat> so again, we are only talking about microbiome imbalance, not an infection. So we are not talking about spike in one particular microbe here. We are talking about loss of microbes, microbial diversity. That is what we are talking about. And then we work on how to replenish them. The diversity matters. The more the diverse, more healthy you are. So the diversity shrinks at both ends of life. The, the, the more it shrinks, that's the old age. The, the, the starting point is the newborn. Okay. So we are talking just about the microbial imbalance and we work on replenishing this microbiome. So how do we do this? So we have two approaches. One is the bottom-up approach and the other is the top-down approach. So in the bottom-up approach, we just look for the microbes. This is the microbial layer. So this is the microbial layer. Then we go on to look at what genes these microbes produce. And then the third layer is the metabolites that they produce. So first, the microbe. Second, the, their genes, or uh, genes, genes in terms of their response to the environment, the response to environment. So we look at the transcriptomics of the microbes that are present. And then we look at their metabolites directly. So there are three studies that is going on. One is the metabolomics. And then the centerpiece is the transcriptomics. And then the first is the metagenomics. 
the three omics approach that we use. Uh, so depending on the question we ask, we, we can either go top down where we start from the metabolites and then we go up all the way looking for what kind of microbes that are, that are altered. So these are the two approaches that are possibly we, we use in all our studies to predict what has changed and then only when you predict can you intervene. So it all starts with prediction. So this is another common question people ask me, is your gut same as mine? Of course, no. All of us carry a different, different ID card in terms of the micro, microbiome that we carry. So microbiome varies person to person. So what determines this variation? So it is going to vary based on, <coughs> so the composition, who they are, and what they do d is predominantly determined by gender, age, geography. Geography matters. You might wonder how, how geography, geography matters. The host physiology, lifestyle, host genetics, and the most important one is the diet. Why? Because three times a day, minimum, and everything that goes into your mouth will determine what microbes that, that will come, uh, that you're feeding, basically. You're feeding the microbes. It is not just you're eating food for yourself, you're feeding the microbes. Whatever goes into your mouth will determine the kind of microbes that you will have, starting from your mouth, oral microbiome, to all the way to the fecal microbiome. So, and infection is an occasional event, but I think all of us carry, from my experience, all of us carry all kinds of microbes. It is only waiting for a right time to express. There is no, uh, you know, no opportunistic uh, microbe. It is all there. I, I can show you some data where, you know, we find Shigella in many of these undernourished children. Shigella is there. All, all the Shigella that you can think of is there in the gut normally. <clears throat> Only thing is they are all kept under control by the common cell. So these are various factors that determine that is why there is a need for study. Studying controls common cells in all of us. And that's why we might vary, but if you look at a, as a population, we might not be different. Say 20 years old in Thiruvalla, 20, 30 Thiruvalla stu uh, students, say for example, hostel students with the same diet, age, going to the same class, same stress level, might be having a similar pattern. So that's what we end up deriving signatures and then we go for intervention. All right, so uh, this is uh, another, another thing that uh, we all uh, uh, know about India, India's diverse country with food being, you know, diverse across spicy to whatever. So what, what is common, common between all of us is just one thing, traditionally, the spice, the fermented food, and high fiber diet. These are three common things that, that are traditionally we follow, but I'm talking traditionally. I mean, uh, all the senior people here would understand because these are the three things that we have been practicing, you know, traditionally, but all the younger generation have moved away from this, eating more of refined food to more of the, the so-called Arabian, Arabian uh, food. I saw a lot of Arabian <laughs> restaurants as we are coming yesterday. So I think this is not, this is not what is being followed by the younger generation. So I know the trouble starts from there. <clears throat> so those are the three points that we focus on uh, uh, in general. This, these are the three points that we advise in general when, we, when people approach us for the microbiome modifiers. <clears throat> so this is, uh, I would like to start from this. From now, I'll share my data. Uh, all the data that I'll share is from my lab and then uh, um, uh, this is a very simple, uh, simple picture. Um, does long-term diet change the microbiome? Yes, it does. If you see, the red color and the green color flip. The green is from the tribal population, uh, which uh, this is a paper from 2017. The study was done in Valor, 
where the green is from the Jawad tribe. These tribes are surprisingly not too far away from our CMC. They're just across the road, but we have to go up the hill. You know, these patients, if they have to come, they just come down the hill to our community center. So we went to them and looked at the microbiome and then the nearest village. You see the flip here. They're just distinct. They are not even overlapping anywhere. So that's where we started. And then we looked at, uh, you know, we looked at whether there is any signature pattern. We found, surprisingly, the tribal population had this green bars more, which is the Fecalibacterium prosnitsi. The French, now they are developing this as probiotic for Crohn's disease. So they have characterized Fecalibacterium prosnitsi, and then they are, are going to use this as the probiotics for Crohn's disease. Well, you see the yellow ones that are found in the nearby village, and it's lactobacillus, and predominantly it is lactobacillus acidophilus. Very simple. The tribal population never drank milk. They don't drink milk. They eat pork, they eat beef, no problem, but they don't drink milk. Well, the rural population, they don't eat any of those things. They're the chicken and mutton eaters with all the milk that is available to them. So there's a flip. You can see the color. I mean, the Fecalibacterium prosnitz is lower that side. Similarly, Bifidobacterium and Clostridium, again. Clostridium, not the, the Clostridium difficile kind. It is the, the, the Clostridium, uh, which is a good kind of Clostridium. So Bifidobacterium and Clostridium, there's a flip here again. So similarly, if you looked at these two bacteria, Ruminococcus and Roseberia, there is no such, such patterns except for we took the male and female. If you looked at the brown ones predominant in the male, that is the Ruminococcus, while the green is the Roseberia, which is predominant in the female. So we got curious, why should a particular bacteria be predominant in women and one, why predominant in male? So, these are some start, starting points that uh, uh, when I was leaving from CMC Valor, I just, that's my starting point. So that's where I moved from Dr. Rama's lab. By then Dr. Rama had retired, so I moved from there and then I chose microbiome and undernutrition biology as my area of research interest and then I started. So, so this is the first question I started on, uh, uh, understanding. So to do that, we just, um, there are two reasons why we did this. One, uh, I progressively study our challenge, why we should not be supplementing iron orally. So, and especially in pregnant women, we gave it for 180 days, 100 milligrams. Now it has become 60 milligrams. Uh, the 60 milligram change happened after multiple pushes that we gave publications showing that lactobacillus decrease with uh, in anemic women, and then we also published that the fecal iron and the lactobacillus had inverse relationship, and then we we also wrote uh, on invitation we wrote uh, uh, a review saying that you know it's a double-edged sword. Uh, supplementing iron is a double-edged sword. So why is that? Because we know just 10 percent of iron that we consume get absorbed, or less than 10 percent gets absorbed, and remaining 90 percent is in the lumen. And what does it do? It is there for the microbes to chew, as simple as that. It, the microbes chew, and then they are going to be uh, iron-dependent microbiome is going to, microbes are going to flourish. So are they good or bad, and how are they going to influence the mother? And that is something that I'm studying. I'm looking at ways to supplement. I mean, I can't change the national program, so what we are doing is we are giving iron supplementation with what we want to do. So I'm not sharing that, but the need for this was, this study was, we needed a predictive tool that should say we, could, we reset anemic to non-anemic model. So what we did is we just took anemia across age. We just collected stool sample. We just, just went, went to the community. We just collected stool sample across age. And then we collect, looked at anemic and non-anemic two groups, and then we, um, about 1,800 people we uh, screened for anemia. 459 were anemic. And then of the 459, about 200 we collected samples. And 120 we succeeded looking at microbiome. This is across age. 
and we thought we'll collect only simple simple details from them diet is homogeneous because they are all from the homo in, in a single village age is different and just two parameters we collected hemoglobin and nlr we just calculated the neutrophil and versus lymphocyte ratio that's it why we kept it simple because we wanted to develop a predictive tool to to just see whether we reset this anemic by giving a uh, feeding what we wanted to feed and then reset them to non anemic so this is typically um, okay here if you see here the lower lower quartile of the nlr microbiome in the in individuals with with lower nlr quartile had significant the orange thing is anemia and then the blue one is non anemic had slightly more microbes or in fact this is an alpha indices alpha indices means it shows that there is increase uh, counts of microbes while your observed otus look same when your observed otu looks same almost same but your your simpson index increases which means there is a spike in one or two types of microbes so then we got curious to identify the shannon and simpson both have spiked only in anemic so we got uh, interested to know which of those microbes got spiked because the otus are similar same numbers are there but this, there is a spike so which means there is one microbe that is increased to our surprise we found the same microbe that was more in women is high in anemic and this microbe we found it to be rosberia fishes the rosberia fishes the rosberia that is the rosburia which is high in women is high in anemic individuals okay so we just had nlr and the uh, and we identified the microbes and then we found just the rosberia spiked in anemic women so all the three parameters that i told hemoglobin mcv nlr and all the microbes that so we found lot of correlation so we just took the microbes hemoglobin and nlr the top 20 microbes that are associated with these parameters and we took just the two parameters hemoglobin and nlr we could develop a predictive model to about 82% accuracy we can we can actually detect anemic or non anemic so which means now using this tool i can just feed somebody continuously for 180 days and then say whether i flip them from anemia to non anemia so we finally published this this year in frontiers nutrition and that's a very simple thing we did we just collected stool samples from anemic non anemic we just looked at the microbes only two blood parameters nlr and hemoglobin that's it so we could tell tell whether these people are anemic just by changing these microbes so this is useful for me in terms of developing an intervention strategy so that's the starting point and then the nio we call it the nioba study where it is the native yogurt banana is is the kind of uh, uh, prebiotic diet that that we are giving for pregnant women for 180 days and we are trying to look at how we can change this so i don't have the results ready yet so i would i would you know come up later or i'll share it with anjali when we have some interesting results so this rosberia could be at we could find out at the you know at a predictive level so the area under curve is more than about 85% so which means this can be even used with hemoglobin uh, it it can be in you know just hemoglobin plus your rosberry fishes if you see in the fecal samples you can say this person is iron deficient anemia as simple as that all right so the next that is the nutrient access so next i'll go to the gut uh, liver access i thought sir is here so i should talk something about liver this is the data i presented yesterday in the conference so uh, nafeld the non alcoholic fatty liver disease or now it is being rechristened as nafeld the metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver uh, so here if you see there are there are two stages 
uh, up till which the NASH, which is the histopathological uh, phenotype of NAFLD, uh, up till this, it is a reversible step. And then beyond that, it is an irreversible uh, process. So that, uh, that made us wonder why there is a point that it flips from reversible to irreversible process. With my student, uh, we are trying to devise more uh, in vitro studies. But before that, we wanted to do the first step, as always, to characterize these patients. So how do we characterize these patients? Two questions we had. One is, to characterize one is, we looked at the prevalence of NAFLD. If you looked at India, there is a high prevalence of NAFLD. Red is more than 30 percent. And if you look at Africa, either they were not studied or the proportion is less than 15. And if you looked at this blue circles here, the blue circle are the PNPLA3 gene. And then the light blue is the, is the, is the next uh, or the mutant variety of PNPLA3. So the dark blue shade is the wild variety that all of us are carrying, most of us are carrying. And the light blue variety is the next mutated variety. So why am I saying this? Because there are two genes that are typically implicated. I'll go to the next slide and I'll explain it a little further. So this is how NAFL prevalence in India looks like. Down south, it is about 50% NAFLD. Up north is again 49 to 50%, 53%. So there is no difference across the country. Yeah, on an average, more than 30% NAFLD prevalence. So we have multiple causes for it. Uh, like all the other chronic uh, conditions, there are multiple uh, factors uh, that determines the disease. Particularly, we are looking at three factors. One is the two genes that we think PNPLA3 and TM6SF2, both of them are involved in the lipid metabolism. And two, the microbiome. And then three, the diet. So these are the three factors that we are trying to look at. What we found is to do that, of course, we had four groups of uh, uh, participants. One is the lean NAFLD. The control is the lean control. Obese NAFLD and obese control were the four study groups. And then uh, they were going through the routine LFTs. They went through the ultrasound. Fibro scan, and then uh, that's it, the routine way of diagnosing NAFLD. Uh, so LFTs, Fibro scan, and uh, we have the genotype, blood samples for genotype, and then stool sample for microbiome. That's all. So it is a DM thesis work in collaboration with Dr. S.P. Singh. Uh, we worked uh, with the SCB team. And what we found is that the lean and control, lean control versus lean NAFL, they are different. Obese control, obese NAFL, they are different phenotypes in terms of microbiome. All the four put together, again, looked different. Here, interestingly, we decided to top up them with the genotype, the predisposed genotype. So if you see TT, CT, TT, CC attached to them, these are the particular genotypes. These, we group them into various genotypes. Still, they are different. <clears throat> so we went on further to look at, uh, this is for the PNPLA3, and this is for the TM6SF2. Both genotypes we took. The G is the pathogen, pathogenic genotype, okay, while the CC is the wild type. Um, for the PNPLA3, here it is the CC and the T variant is the pathogenic variant. So then we layered the microbiome on top of this genotype. And then we found that there is a pattern that goes through uh, these phenotypes in lean NAFLD versus obese NAFLD. If you see that certain microbes stay on top with the pathogenic, uh, pathogen variant while they are less in the, so there is a shift of microbes with respect to their genotype as well. So 
uh, this is another finding that it's still not published. We are still working on it. Then we went ahead and we wanted to find, is there a particular microbe that we can call indicator for this particular genotypes? So then we pulled out and then we found for the lean, both lean varieties, we found for PN, PLA3, Lactobacillus salivarius was increased. Bacteria, bacteria, Bacteroides fragilis was increased. They are the signature species for this particular mutation that was found in lean. And then for, uh, for TM6, SF2, lean NAFL, we found Fecalibacterium prosnitsi that's getting increased. So again and again, we have this rosemary species popping out. Uh, so this is, then we are looking forward to, you know, isolate these microbes and to sequence and work on it. So that's, uh, that's our future plan. So these are certain signature microbes that we find signature to these particular genotypes. So what does that mean? So then we looked at all the parameters that we measured, like the starting from the AG ratio, ALT, BMI, FIP4 score, fibroscan, hemoglobin, HOMA IR, insulin, triglycerides. And we looked at all the microbes. Say, for example, we saw lactobacillus salivaris associated with lean. So if you looked at this, triglycerides, and then the black spot, black spot is positive correlation, and OF, say, for example, obese fibrous, fibrous uh, liver. Okay? So we classified them as fibrotic, uh, fibrotic, non-fibrotic, uh, and lean fibrotic, obese fibrotic, lean non, uh, so these are the color codes that, that is there. I know it is difficult to look at all of them. So for now, say for example, triglycerides, if you looked at the triglycerides level as the microbes increase, there are a lot of negative associations. You have one, two, three negative associations. We have for, um, say for example, let us take the violet one. So it goes all the way to a particular microbe that is negatively correlating with triglyceride. And this violet is for fibrosis. So similar associations, so what does this mean? So what does this mean? So because we know that some microbes are positively associated and some are negatively associated with fibrosis. So, so that's the catch. So we have to now tweak it and go outside the body to look at how these microbes are uh, influencing this reversibility of the liver. So we are trying to now characterize patient and see how we can grow cells to look at uh, primary culture basically and to challenge them with these changes that we see to work on the regenerative capacity of, uh, um, so, uh, of the liver. So that's the kind of approach we want to take with this data. <clears throat> So I'm skipping all this because this is the kind of thing I mentioned with that flow, ch I mean, the, the, the correlation chart. So to specifically mention, so if, you are, if you're seeing here triglyceride and uh, positively correlating with the lactobacillus salivaris, this is the kind of thing we just plotted in one, one graph so that it's easy to observe. So otherwise the data would look like this, where, you know, increase in triglycerides, increase in this particular microbe. So what do we do? We know these are the changes that we see. So now we keep wondering how can we manipulate the microbiota to improve health? So there are plenty of the studies that we do uh, in terms of uh, prebiotic intervention or the fermented food intervention. These are some of the, some of the activities that, that are ongoing. Let me be very specifically, uh, let me show some studies. So these are various options we have. Let me specifically show a study. <clears throat> um, this is uh, a funded project from Australia. It's an, uh, from the Flinders University, uh, where um, we had an exchange student uh, who's still working on her thesis. By October, she will submit. Um, it's a very simple study again. We just made prebiotic chapatis, nothing fancy. Prebiotic chapatis, we know the dosage of this prebiotics. It is well worked out in our lab. So about 40 grams of prebiotics were rolled into chapatis and we fed HIV patients. From zero to about 99, uh, 112 days with a lot of, uh, you know, crossovers we did. And it's a crossover feeding study. Basically every 15 days we 
cross them over to a normal diet. And then, so they were getting this prebiotic chapatis every 15 days, door delivered. And then what did we achieve? <coughs> first thing we achieved is we could reduce the viral load. That's the first thing we achieved. We reduced the viral load. Of course, they were all on ART. So in addition to the ART, this was happening. So the viral load decreased. So where this is the baseline, while you know these are the diets. Second, we could improve the CD4 counts. Okay, we could increase the CD4 count. What we did is, each color is a patient at nine different time points where we collected their stool samples and looked at the microbiome. Each time point is the microbiome. So if you looked at this blue color, the sample one is the baseline. You could see that we achieved moving the microbe. So if, imagine if, the, if this were to move, the microbiome changed from this spot to this spot and ultimately at the ninth point, it is here, S9. The last time point, the microbiome was here. So if you, could, if you could imagine the microbiome shifting from one pattern to the other pattern to, you know, in this time point. So similarly, we could manage changing the microbiome pattern from one point to the other point, influencing the gut immune axis. So what is the best way to study the gut immune axis is the, what is called immunophenotyping. I don't have data to show that, but that's the best way I, uh, to go about it, where you can phenotype your immune cells. Take the immune cells out and look for the characteristics of the proteins that are expressed on the cell surface is the best way to do it. So here, just for the sake of uh, you know, uh, this thing, I just put one graph because I don't have more than one slide here. So, so what we could do is we could change the microbiome and we could influence both the, the viral load as well as the CD4 counts. Uh, we also, another intervention study that we do is to, uh, we developed uh, in collaboration with Biome Pharma in US, uh, a product called Vagibiome, and then kind of we, um, we use them as vaginal suppositories and we could modify the microbes. And then we showed uh, how these microbes were asso uh, associated with the vaginal pH. We improved, changed the vaginal pH as well as uh, the total vaginal health index score could be altered with the probiotics that we used. Yeah. So the point is, what we are doing is we feed the microbes, basically. So we feed prebiotics or probiotics, or uh, we help the microbes that are residing with, within us to, to, sh to change the diversity of the microbe in return we also change the functionality of the microbiome that is residing within us. We, we use these many interventional options that are uh, ready with us, uh, probiotics, prebiotics. I say dietary inter intervention and fermented food could be an easier, straightforward option that is re ready in your kitchen. The last is the fecal microbiome transplant. I'm sure that is being practiced well in Kerala and they have established various uh, regulatory uh, bodies in Kerala, at least if not in other states, for the fecal microbiome transplant. <clears throat> so at the end, it is better always to predict and look at the best interventional option that are available for now. Uh, the prebiotics are plenty in India. Uh, we don't pay attention to them. So that could be also a good supplementary uh, option. So the fermented food for chemotherapy, we use simple butter to work on the, you know, uh, for the neutropenia and to resolve uh, uh, conditions like, uh, you know, all the side effects of the chemotherapy. All these are DM projects that are currently going on with, uh, in collaboration with uh, our team. Finally, uh, I thank my mentor, Professor Ramakrishna, and this is my team. And I've benefited from various funding agencies, particularly the ongoing studies in my lab are funded by the Gates. Uh, Gates, uh, as Sir mentioned, Gates has funded me uh, to characterize fermented rice water and to, uh, to intervene um, 
the nutrient uh, malnourishment in pregnant women and to develop this as product. So they have uh, generously given me uh, money. Uh, and then the Odisha State DST and ICMA and DBT have been kind enough to give some funds. Um, so, so thank you for patient hearing. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, Bala, for that excellent presentation that opens our eyes. And I see Chepsi ready for its come questions. Philip there, Dr. Thomas Chako. But I just wanted to tell you one little bit which he said for all the clinicians here. Dr. S.P. Singh was junior to me in college. He is now professor of gastroenterology. He's, he's um, retired, sir. He's retired. Sorry, he's retired? He's retired yeah, months. he's retired. But this guy is all over the world with this NAFL data which <laughs> Bala is giving him. Okay? Every other day he sends us something and he's all over the world talking about NAFL because of the work that Bala is doing. So for all of you clinicians, the microbiome is the in thing, is there in the laboratory and we are grateful to Bala for welcoming Anjali uh, to his laboratory and we are working with him on a couple of projects and it looks as though Renu Matthew will be the star of the show in the next few years. Okay, questions? It's a wonderful talk. This, uh, actually, I clinically apply the, your daily uh, this uh, talk in clinical practice. I have got a series of cases with uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, our traditional fermented rice, Padanganyi. We yes. tried in many patients and found to be very successful. And uh, uh, one thing, uh, this uh, particular, when alteration of the gut microbiota take place, uh, this uh, GLP stimulation, GLP uh, stimulation as well as the ghrelin, which actually create a statity very early in f for the particular food, especially unrefined food with a brand. Another question is, our food is contain a lot of little bit uh, antibiotics from the farm side. That also can alter the gut back. So uh, I'm not asking too many questions. There is a lot of people are there to, to ask questions. Yeah, th those, are, those are the problems of our country. I mean, a lot of uh, insecticides, pesticides, which we have no idea how to get rid of them. So that I don't have an answer to that. So, so <laughs> fermented rice is... Actually, I prefer uh, advising fermented rice empty stomach. So, um, mostly for two reasons. One is that uh, you have all the w required vitamins that are there. So, we have data that shows that vitamin K, B1, B12 are significantly increased in the fermented rice water. Yeah, so that uh, I don't have an answer now. Uh, and for ghrelin also. But ghrelin, one thing is that uh, um, with dementia, um, at least here. So with dementia data, uh, we have measured what is called an acylated ghrelin versus ghrelin ratio. <coughs> I haven't shared that. So we have some interesting data there because ghrelin is associated with almost all the metabolic syndrome. Plus, it has got something to do with, um, uh, I will say, gut-brain access for now. Uh, I will let it at that. So we are still working on that. That that is that we we have we can't help it. I mean that is the only reason why we have to go with all the fermented foods because almost all the food you name it will have some amount of what you are saying. In fact, in fact, the AMR is a big deal because of that. Starting from your chicken to everything. Thank you. It was a very, very fascinating talk. Gut microbiome was very, anyway interesting. You've made it even more interesting for all of us, very lucid. So in all your presentation, the what what I was able to gather was more than, you called it the God molecule, but you never dis, you're not discussing about those short chain fatty acids, but more focusing on the particular microbe itself. Is that the way the field is going? Are, are we moving towards? No, 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 we have to look at it holistically, you're correct. So we, we are working, say for example, I told you uh, about uh, simple butter feeding. I mean, that's a DM Hemat uh, uh, student. He's working on uh, AML patients where he's looking at feeding butter, 10 grams of Amul butter 
that's all we do every day morning he gives the child and then looks for uh, the neutropenia that's with, uh, looking to improve the condition so basically uh, it's the short chain fatty acid in butter we are not even talking about microbes there so if in fact, uh, um, in fact, I, I, I'm sure we, we, I should talk about what is called Prep D. It's uh, it's uh, uh, from our lab from CMC Valor. Now it's been marketed in Adelaide, in Australia, as a rehydration drink, which we are planning to br bring it back to India also now. It's a it's a rehydration solution with prebiotic. All we are saying is that use these molecules to produce short chain fatty acid. Short chain fatty acid, typically. I called it God molecule mostly because acetate and butyrate, any biochemist here, they will understand everything, everything, almost everything that you eat goes down to acetate. Everything, okay? And then butyrate again. Two acetate is butyrate. So these are easily absorbed by any cell and we just, if any sign of these molecules coming, we just overexpress the GPR 43 or 40, uh, 43, 44, 109 receptors, overexpress these receptors, and then we just grab every single molecule that comes our way. So that's why fermented food we are talking about. And these molecules can go all the way to the DNA, acylation of the DNA, or butylation of the DNA, and then they modify the transcription depending on the stimuli that is, that is happening. So these are small molecules easily absorbable, not just in the colon. And in fact, in colon, it's even more important because all the short chain fatty acid acts as so only source of carbon for them there. Okay, so every cell, we, we in fact, uh, I have a publication recently, we just sprayed honey for atrophic rhinitis in the nose. And then we showed that the GPR 43, uh, the receptors are highly expressed. Short chain fatty acids are in increased in the nose. As simple as that. We could heal the, heal the wound just by spraying honey. The manuka honey, we just bought it and we sprayed 10% manuka honey. So all this, and we are just translating this to the wound healing next. We, just, we have been doing this in our department in CMC Velour where we produce, we just give butrate enema. We just uh, make butrate in our lab, we know. And uh, we open the butrate bottle, our uh, senior professor, K, K B we call him. <laughs> so he walks out, he says, you guys have opened the butrate in the Williams building. So he walks out for his coffee. I mean, butrate, we have been practicing short chain fatty acid. We give short chain fatty acid directly. And fermented food is one of the sources which has good amount of short chain fatty acid, not too high. I can't tell an elderly person to go and take, uh, you know, 100 grams of butter or 10 grams of butter every day. He would look at me differently. So fermented rice water would be a good alternative for it with the right amount of short chain fatty acid. So. It all boils down to the metabolites at the end. We are, we have to look at it holistically. Yes. Uh, during our training, I think generally our pediatricians used to tell us expensive vitamins and minerals make the urine costly. And that's what we've been brought upon. And we shun the general practitioners who give a lot of vitamins and we say stick to the essential drugs. You know? So now we are challenging the dogmas in a sense. You know? So, and realistically to expect the younger generation who's enjoying the refined foods and the, the, these foods to change to these sort of food is not easy. So what do you think? Do you think we should be going back to prescribing more, especially I deal with endocrinology and obesity. Do you think in obesity, I'm not very sure, you present the NAFLD research. Do you think we should be encouraging more people to have more vitamins or which particular type of vitamin supplements should we say? In Kerala, we have the children wanting to give loads of vitamins from Gulf and US to their parents. What would you recommend? I, I, <laughs> I'm just saying that your gut microbes is capable of producing those vitamins. You just feed the microbes, that's what I would say. But it's difficult to get those children eating, eating those stuff. So either you, we have to, see that's where our, our, our major strategy is to design, make a designer probiotic, designer food for these kids because we're talking about designer yogurts for them. You have to have fancy names, otherwise your medical students are not going to consume yogurt. You say curd in the mess, nobody's going to tell you. talk about designer yogurt, they're going to touch it. Make it fancy. I mean, that's, that's the only way out. Make it fancy. I mean, that's the only way out. 
So we, we are trying to make all these products. Uh, when in fact, I'm just thinking, what am I doing in a research institute still? I should, I should start my own company and start making these foods, yeah. Yeah, another thing I just recently heard that uh, you are, when you, you, if you are a native of this place, you should eat a food around four, 15 square kilometers. Perfect. Are you, is it yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. We are, we are all made, we are all made to adjust to our environment. Typically, the oil that uh, I can tell you in Kerala, it's the coconut oil. It's not the same in Tamil Nadu. It's the, it's the till oil. You go north, it is the mustard oil. I mean, we are all used to what is being made, and then that is what we are made of. I mean, so it is best to stick to the traditional food. Thank you, Dr. Balamurigan, for the wonderful presentation. I am a microbiologist. So my uh, doubt was, stool sample will be having trillions of diverse bacteria. Yeah. So how will you quantify which is the predominant one? What is the method which you used? Yeah. So I, I'll tell you. I mean, uh, it's a very simple. Stool samples will have all the microbes that are there. So the only way out is, there are two approaches to it. I told you metagenomics and stopped at it. The simple way is there are two approaches again. You just take the DNA and then sequence the entire DNA. It's called, it is, it is the DNA's DNA, that's it. You just take the stool sample, extract DNA, and then you sequence the DNA. So that is one approach. The advantage of that approach is it will not only give the list of microbes that are present, it will also tell you the presence of various genes that are that are there. So second approach is what is called an amplicon sequencing. It is a less expensive thing that we can easily do it first to get a snapshot of what is happening. Then we can do a targeted approach. An amplicon sequencing uses the 16S ribosomal RNA. 16S ribosomal RNA is about 1,500 base pairs long. And then it has about nine variable regions in it. So you're free to choose uh, to keep some of those variable regions uh, should be sequenced. Okay, so you should you should free to choose whichever variable regions you want, and then keep those variable regions between your uh, your amplification product, because this variable region is the ones that will help you identify the species. There will be two other regions called the the conserved regions. The conserved regions is where you can you can design your primers and then you amplify your DNA. So once you amplify the DNA, all bacterial DNA is being amplified, and then you will see, when you sequence, you will, you will get all the variable reads that you get are the ones that will speciate you. So you will get a read that is about, uh, you know, uh, depending on the abundance. Say, for example, if a microbe that you see is abundant at, the, uh, um, at 10 to the power 5, and then the lowest abundance goes to one microbe, say, for example. And then if, if you are doing uh, to the depth of, uh, you know, uh, you will be able to get, uh, say, for example, 10 power, uh, uh, 10 uh, microbes you can get. So 10 power 5 will be predominantly, you will, uh, you, will, you will be identifying, while you won't be getting that one microbe for sure, because you have to increase the depth that much higher. So, what we have showing here is a relative abundance. If that were to be 100, uh, the total microbe would be 100, then your predominant one is 50%, 40%, and so on. The, the least one will be 0.01%, and so on. So you get the spread of microbes. So for our analysis, what we do is we take top 10, top 20, or the microbes that are about covering 90% of the entire population. So we will anyway let go this 10% of population because of low, very low counts. That is the first thing. So and then the 90% coverage we we use. The lower uh, ones we go only based on the uh, further analysis, where we think that this is uh, this has some implications with various parameters that we are trying to uh, put them together. So we start from top. 90%, then we go down to the other microbes as well. So we get the entire spectrum depending on the depth of sequencing. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, doctor, for your excellent presentation and wishing you well. Thank you, ma'am. This is just a comment. 
so i spend lot of time in the kitchen also <laughs> apart from my work and uh, i found out that there are some brands of curd with which you can't make curd and there are some brands with which you can make curd i hope you understand the difference yes so out of curiosity we just bro i just brought a few drops of each and we did a gram stain and we found that the one with which you can make curd has lot of lactobacilli and the one which with which we cannot had uh, no lactobacilli and it had rather it had yeast and uh, there was some uh, looks like uh, strep but i was surprised there's no lactobacilli so how can we so people shouldn't get uh, you know like all curds are not uh, lactobacillus la don't have all the so probiotics or uh, as we think it so that kind of information also our people should uh, get correct. so yes. have you noted something like that is there some so i'll i'll tell you uh, i have one publication on that where we made curd and we published it of course not just one curd so we so the thing is very simple all this fermented food follow a certain succession pattern actually um so what determines the succession pattern is very simple the starter culture second starter culture is the first in or, or the the starter culture is the ino the inoculum that you take and then you inoculate into the milk so what what we do is the temperature does matter the temperature determines the first microbe that will uh, that will flourish the strep thermophilus is the first microbe in a typical curd which grows at 42 degrees celsius if you have um, i'm sure you're all microbiologists so now we have um, like lactobacillus panel the api kit which talks about if you just raise it to 28 degrees 28 degrees only one lactobacillus grows 32 one one lactobacillus grows it's a it's a strip of biochemicals you just incubate it at 28 degrees you can identify that microbe that that it comes to that 2 degrees change one microbe is lost so so the curd formation is a kind follows a succession pattern starting from strep it goes we it lactobacillus peaks only at a particular particular time it's a 12th hour that's why we don't ferment curd for more than 12 hours overnight ferment eat it by lunch but nobody tells us that we just finish it for lunch and we stop it and then they we are also told don't eat curd in the night some cultures practice that depending on the temperature the cur curd is not eaten in the night it's only had for lunch then again night it starts and then it goes for lunch so uh, the peak lactobacillus concentration is at 12th hour to 16th hour the 12th to 16th hour has the maximum lactobacillus and then the lactobacillus goes down the more you keep it lactobacillus goes down so so that is the curd actually so again at the 12th to 16th hour if you if you if we took out the microbes we studied for uh, we co cultured with uh, vibrio colrace shigella all the pathogen strains that were in the lab we could see that it it could it could resist their colonization but not beyond that so the 12th to 16th hour is the best cut similarly same thing for the fermented rice also 8 hour 12 hour 18 hours 24 hours the alcohol content starts increasing after 18 hour so again even fermented rice in india we have to consume early in the morning and that's it beyond that you lose all the beneficial microbes in that also so that uh, soon we are going to publish that data so the 12th to 16th hour is the period time period that you, we are supposed to consume it thank you ma'am so we have learned that microbiome itself is a very huge and vast as well as a deep subject where i mean where we can do lot of research and i invite and i'm very happy to inform that we have in our central research laboratory microbiome work going on in uh, collaboration with dr balamurgan and i invite all of you all our clinicians anybody who is interested in microbiome research to come to us and we we have a very open minded very friendly person to collaborate with and we can think about uh, uh, more and more research on the topic
Thank you, Dr. Bala, for the interesting uh, talk. And uh, I request um, our principal ma'am, Dr. Girija Mohan, to hand over our token of appreciation and love to Dr. Bala Murugan. Thank you all for the participation.